yeah. everybody listening. We're making it all up. And I'll tell you why. Neuroscience says that we, we process only 20% of reality at any one time. So this room that I'm observing right now, yeah. my brain is only getting 10% on the sides and I'm rendering the rest. And to give you an example, you pro you've probably had the experience where you went into the kitchen and you said, where's the salt shaker? And they said, it's right there on the counter. <laughs> no, it isn't. And then finally they come up from the table, they come into the room, they show you the salt shaker. It's right there in front of you. The problem was you didn't render it because in your mind, you said the salt shaker wasn't there. So interesting. Th th in psychology, they have a term for it. They call it a stictoma. That means like when Jesus said, you can't see the sin in another with a stick in your eye. So psychology kind of coined that term, stictoma. That's so, funny. So, so we all have blind spots. Yeah. You know, and if something's in your blind spot, like, and this happens with opportunities and with your work as a relationship expert, if you're running around thinking everyone's negative, every guy's a SOB, every girl's a cheater, wh whatever you're thinking, yeah. then you have this filtering system that makes up your reality. They, that perfect person could be sitting right there. But if your belief system hasn't changed so you can accept to see that person, it doesn't matter how much you want them to show up. If your belief system that's blocking you, that stick toma, that stick or that stick blind spot the is there. That's funny. So, you know, and that's why people go, gosh, I started doing this or that. I started thinking differently. I read this book, went to this seminar, and all of a sudden, Miss Wonderful or Mr. Wonderful right. shows up. That's because they were always there. There was always an opportunity. The universe is abundant. So these opportunities show up all the time. An example I tell with my dad, because when I started my business, of course, as a therapist, there's something you need to know about therapists. They're all really good. You know, we, you sit around with the therapist and you talk about how great you are, you know. So I'm sitting around with my dad. Hey, we're really good. You know, we have no money, you know. So, so we're, you know, <laughs> if we're such a good therapist, where's the money? And, and so I my dad says, we just need somebody to invest in us. This was ba way back in the 80s. Well, we get a phone call from his friend, Dr. Paul Adams, who's a famous a therapist. And he says to my dad, he says, I want to open up a center in Scottsdale, Arizona. Would you like to do it? And my dad said, no, thank you. We're going to do our own thing. Hangs up. And I'm, I'm sitting at the table with him. I'm like dumbfounded. I said, dad, we just talked. It's like, it's like Gilligan's Island, you know, when they say, <laughs> man, I'd really like to have this. And then the radio says it or something yeah. like that. And this just happens. The coincidence was there. And I said, what are you doing? I didn't know Dr. Adams at the time, Yeah, Paul. And then so I said, do you mind if I call him? So I called up Paul and I said, look, Paul, I'm, I'm Michael's son. I do want to help you. What do I need to do so you can set up the center in Scottsdale? I went out and got all the information he wanted and FedExed him back a package within 48 hours. He said, you must be fired up. I said, yeah, yeah I'm going to help you do this. I said, we had, I said, you won't believe this, but before you called, my dad and I were just talking about it. My dad did not see the opportunity because he was sick, so fixated on his own belief. The biggest thing between success and failure is not that it's, the opportunities aren't there. It's your belief you already know what you need to know. The real danger is what you don't know. So if you can keep, I call it an infinite field possibility thinking, instead of thinking you know the way. You know, that's what in, in Zen Buddhism, they call it a new mind. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to have a new mind in these opportunities and opportunities show up. I'm curious in the example that you gave about the field, right? And mm -hmm. creating, that we have these fixed ways of thinking and those are easier for our brain to walk down, right? Like mm. beliefs, yeah. thoughts, feelings. Mm. And so they become these cyclic, easy pathway, easy belief, yeah. like there's no good people out there. I'm curious, when we go to change, like when we go to experience a new thought or change our belief, and you're talking about pushing down that four foot high grass for the first time, I'm wondering what part is biological and what part, because I think you know, whenever we want to do something new, it feels hard, right? right? There's there's the unknown. So which part is like truly the unknown that we're we're just scared? And which part is actually the biological aspect of creating a new neural pathway or are they different? Like there is no separation of anything in the known universe. So let me explain this to you. Yeah. Everything's beads on a string. So well, let's do an example. If if you're not driving your car listening to this podcast, put your hands together just like this. And you're clasping your hands together, making like a, not really a prayer, but you're clasped together. And I want you to notice which thumb's on top. There's either the right thumb or the left thumb on top. Yeah. Whichever one is on top, roll the other one on top. What does that feel like? Feels weird. Feels weird. I only ask you to change your thumb. Imagine if I asked you to change, <laughs> you, you go home <laughs> Everything and say, you do. honey, I need you to do this or that. The whole body starts quaking. Yeah. So shake them out, yeah. put your hands back together. And did you put them in the new way or the old way? The old way. Right. So that's what happens every morning. Yeah. So when they say, there's a saying out there, right? It's a, it's a myth, the 21-day myth. 
It's not a reality. There's never been a study done on About 21 days that you can make a change in 21 days. That's not true at all. You only need to make the change once correctly because the brain will rewire itself around any one key idea. And everyone out there has had the experience where you believed in Santa Claus. And then one day, some special friend I remember or him. some older I brother remember. or sister said, there's no Santa Claus. And you went, what? Your whole life changed at that moment because you had a belief in the Easter Bunny, Santa Claus, all these yeah. things. And that's when they say, hey, we, we were being lied to. Now, that's Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. But what other things have you been lied to? There's right. a lot. Yeah, there's a I mean, the right. litany of abuses to our brain goes on and on. The reality is that when we're born, they also know that every child is born with a photographic memory. Every child. We have perfect, re we don't have perfect recall. We have perfect memory. Recall is the brain. Memory is the mind. Think of your brain kind of like a hard drive. And unfortunately, we probably all had this experience where you had this really good computer and one day the hard drive stopped working. Yeah. And you go, all oh, my information's on there. Yeah. This is what happens to those people that get Alzheimer's. All that information is on there because in neuroscience, we could open up the brain. I'm not a surgeon, but if, if I was with a neurosurgeon, they were touch different parts of the brain. That memory would be fully stored, categorized and organized with sensory-based experiences. You would even hear the people behind you in their conversation because they've done studies with this. You record everything. Your body is like the, the perfect recorder, 360-degree recorder. And, but the recall is how the neural pathways get to that information. So if you mm, believe- Like the wire or yes, the- game, So like yeah. if, if, if there were nine kids in my family and my sister, who's my older sister, her childhood was very different than mine. She had this terrible childhood and blah, 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 blah. My childhood was great because I rewrote it. Everybody should have two or three past. If you don't like your past, rewrite it because it doesn't serve you to carry that on. In my book, one of my books, I've written nine of them. One says, I was blessed to be the son of an alcoholic because you got to reframe those past experiences. 